Thank you, Ryan. I have those occasions uh, from time to time when I go out and give speeches. They uh, send a nice car to pick you up, and I had an occasion like that earlier in the week, and the driver looked up in the rearview mirror and said, hey, you're Mike McCurry. Whatever happened to you? <laughs> For my friends that I now engage with from time to time who are in the political world, they say like, okay, you're at Wesley Seminary, like, are, you know, do we call you reverend or something? And I said, no, God has standards for that. <laughs> so, in that spirit, let me begin today. I want to uh, deliver the paper that I would love to get some reflection from all of you later on. During the 2016 presidential campaign, Hillary Clinton running as a candidate for nomination, and then as the Democratic Party candidate, occasionally quoted her Methodist belief that one should do all the good you can, whenever you can, as long as ever you can. That is, of course, a truncated version of a quotation long attributed to John Wesley. Do all the good you can, be all the means you can, in all the ways you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. Professor Kevin Watson, who teaches Wesleyan and Methodist studies at the Candler School of Theology at Emory, has richly documented the case that Wesley never actually uttered those words. That said, there's a close resemblance uh, to the passage in Wesley's sermons on several occasions in 1799 and enough evidence that the admonition to do all the good you can is justified in being called one of John Wesley's rules. But the point is not so much the accuracy of the quotation, but the importance of the observation. Now I know Mrs. Clinton, Secretary Clinton, fairly well. I've seen her draw deeply on her faith at moments of personal crisis and moments of some public peril. She would be, as we begin this discussion for the next two days, a model of what it means to be a Wesleyan in the public square. Now, I don't say that as a cheerleader for all things Clinton, although I'm surely of that pedigree. In fact, I'm somewhat critical of Mrs. Clinton and her campaign for the fact that she did not openly and honestly attest more to the importance of her faith in discussing the ways that she would guide the nation if she had been elected president. But there are reasons she did not. They have to do with our nation's political culture, the ways governance and faith intertwine, the reluctance of mixing politics and religion in a nation that cherishes a tradition of separation of church and faith. And if we're being honest, the fact that religion just not is that cool anymore, which is why so many of our young people seem to avoid it. These are topics that I think I wish that we address as we begin this conference. I thank Professor Ryan Danker who provided uh, the support in organizing this conference. I think I also support, uh, want to thank Mark Tooley if he is here. Mark is a considered a nemesis of the Institutional Methodist Church in some quarters, fairly, I would submit. But his interest in this discussion and suggests that he is someone, like most of us who are here, who want to consider the question of what it means to be a Methodist in the public square. That question has some urgency, given the predicament we now find ourselves in as a nation. We are a deeply divided and troubled country. The sources of discontent run deep. They've been building for some time. And the church needs to offer some response to this condition. And that's what I would like to dissect as we begin our conference today. I'll start with an obvious point, introducing the perspective I will bring. I am clearly not an academic theologian like many of you. I began my career in 1976 after graduating from Princeton as a press secretary in the United States Senate. I worked for Senator Harrison Williams of New Jersey, who managed to wind up in jail as a result of the FBI ABSCAM investigation. If you saw the movie American Hustle, you know that story. Uh, turned out to be good training for what would come later in my career. <laughs> 
I then went on to work for Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, of New York, who was one of the last true public intellectuals to serve in what we call the world's greatest deliberative body. Uh, before too long after that, I was recruited to work in presidential politics and served in every Democratic national campaign from 1984 to 2004. As a Democrat, that means I mostly served losing causes. But in 1992, after working against him in primary campaigns, I served in Colorado for the campaign of Bill Clinton and Al Gore. And after victory in that campaign, my friend George Stephanopoulos uh, managed to help me get appointed as spokesman at the U.S. State Department. And then with the help of Mrs. Clinton, I was asked to become White House Press Secretary in 1995. So for almost four years, I had a little vaudeville act at the White House called the Daily Press Briefing in which I was the human pinata that the press would swing at and bash. Such fun. You'll recall some of the zesty topics addressed, but in this polite company, it's probably best not to put oral sex and oval office in the same sentence. Now, during that tumultuous time, church for me was a safe place, and I had a rule that I did not appear on the Sunday morning talk shows, because that was about the only time I got to be with my family. We went to worship at our local Methodist church in Kensington, Maryland, where the congregation left me alone to my own peace and quiet. As I reflect, I'm disappointed in myself for my failure to connect my faith more directly with the work I did in the other six days of the week. You often have to kill a lot of time working at the White House, waiting for our president, who is usually late, as Bill Clinton famously was most of the time. Many of those hours I spent with George Stephanopoulos, and he was my seatmate on Air Force One and in the various motorcades that took us from here to there. We talked about everything and nothing. He was a very good partner in conversation, but we did not talk about our faith. Now remember that George Stephanopoulos is the son of a Greek Orthodox priest and he even considered seminary and the priesthood himself at one point in his career. And it was not until I read his autobiography, All Too Human, that I discovered that George was going through something of a spiritual crisis at, in the time that we were spending together on the campaign trail. His faith commitments and his role in public life were in conflict, but he kept that very personal, as did I. When I finally left the White House at the end of 1998, my senior pastor at St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Kensington, the Reverend Chet Kirk, he approached me one day and said, now you're done at the White House. He said very carefully, now we have a real job for you to do. And it turned out that was to be church school superintendent. I had never taught Sunday school, and so I quickly asked, somewhat flattered by the invitation, why he thought I was the right person for the job. And he said, well, thinking slowly, because we haven't been able to get anyone to do the job for the last 10 years. <laughs> so one thing led to another, and I signed up, recognized I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I signed up for a course here at Wesley Seminary to equip lay leaders. And the president then, Doug Lewis, and his executive assistant, uh, David McAllister Wilson recognized my name. They called up my pastor and they said, is this the same Mike McCurry who used to work at the White House? And before too long, I was invited not only to be a part of the course I was taking, but recruited to become a member of Wesley's Board of Governors. The experience of serving on the board gave me some insights into theological education and the challenges that seminaries face today. It also created an encounter that we might call a Wesleyan moment of transformational grace. At the end of one of my last meetings as a governor at Wesley, our dean of the faculty, Bruce Birch, approached me and said if I'd be, asked me if I'd be interested in taking his introductory course in the Hebrew Bible. Sure, I said. But it's kind of pointless to take a course if you're not getting a degree. And he thought for a moment and said, you're right, you should get a degree. <laughs> so I did. In 2013, I was one of the first recipients of a new Master of Arts degree in theology that Wesley now confers. It's designed for people just like me, 
Wesley is serious about its role as an institution located in the nation's capital. And we recognize that responsibility with degree specializations in public theology and a non-degree program in faith and public life are a part of what we should be about. That means we want to engage non-traditional students who come from the worlds of government, Capitol Hill, lobbying, advocacy, who are not necessarily bound for ordination, but who want a theological education that will reflect the way faith informs their vocation. We need this now more than ever. It's no overstatement to say that our institutions of self-government in America are seriously broken. Our Congress seems incapable of tackling major issues on the national agenda, healthcare, infrastructure repairs, immigration law reform, tax law changes, the list goes on. A word frequently used in our political lexicon is polarization. It's a useful word indeed because our institutions of government are in a very deep freeze. Politicians, elected leaders, representatives in Congress seem frozen by our inability to warm to common ground where compromise, accommodation, and progress might be found. There are various ways to measure our brokenness. And let's start with some data from the Pew Research Center and the Public Research Religion Institute. First, only 24% of all Americans believe Washington will get it right. So a vast majority of Americans now seriously doubt the ability of their national establishment to act in their interests. Second, a majority of Americans, 58%, believe the country is headed in the wrong direction. Now that's a fundamental question in public opinion research. Is the country going in the right direction or is it on the wrong track? Thank you. Take a little sip of water here. The right track, wrong track result in public opinion is usually correlated with the performance of the national economy. If people are comfortable with their own economic circumstances, then the right track number is usually above 50%. But we are upside down on this now. Our economy is growing uh, slowly, some would argue, but the recovery from the Great Recession of 2008 has been steady and sure, and most economists predict it will continue. Now normally, that would translate to positive numbers in the question about whether the country is on the right track but it doesn't. So what is that about? It's about the deepening polarization in the country and yes, it's about Donald Trump. The political parties in America are in some disrepute. Americans disapprove of the established parties in our two-party system. Uh, both parties rarely get more than double digits in uh, those who say they approve of their performance. Yet most Americans still identify with one party or the other. And even the growing number who say they are quote unquote independent usually wind up sorting themselves out on one side or the other. And their divisions are remarkable. According to, again, data from the Pew Research Center, those who say that government regulation of business usually does more harm than good. 63% of Republicans say yes, only 30% of Democrats. Government is almost always wasteful and inefficient. 69% of Republicans say yes, only 45% of Democrats. Poor people have it easy because they can get government benefits without doing anything in return. 65% of Republicans agree, only 18% of Democrats. The government today can't afford to do much more to help the needy. 69% of, of Republicans agree, only 24% of Democrats. Most corporations make a fair and reasonable amount of profit. 52% of Republicans agree, only 24% of Democrats. Who probably, by the way, believe that corporations make too much profit. Blacks who can't get ahead in this country are mostly responsible for their own condition. 
Seventy-five percent of Republicans agree, only 28 percent of Democrats. Now, there are other questions in this survey, but they all reveal the same thing, that there are two Americas with very different perspectives on every issue on the public agenda. And the gap in the differences between the beliefs of these and the two parties, the Pew survey suggests, looking back over the last 25 years, has grown wider and wider. Republicans are more hardcore conservative now. Democrats usually are more leaning orthodox liberal. The center is evaporating. Now, my former boss, Senator Moynihan, used to say, I'll imitate him, the essential question for the American public is, will the center hold? Will the center hold? The center in our politics is fragile, and I don't know if it will hold. As the poet William Butler Yeats once wrote, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Our issue should be whether or not the church can be at that center. Now, John Wesley was not exactly a centrist. He was a Tory conservative with excellent credentials in front of the crown, good credentials as a faithful Catholic in the midst of a radical transformation in faith. But he was also a shrewd politician, I would submit. He knew when to tack left, tack right, and when to compromise. Wesley was not what we would call a public theologian. He didn't seem to be active in legislative fights in front of the parliament. He used his voice in the public square carefully and deliberately on slavery, slavery, drunkenness, gambling, other issues that maybe reflected what his own holiness code would suggest. He certainly advocated for those who were marginalized in the king's economy, coal miners, the destitute, widows, but he was conscious of the norms that public reality placed upon those in the public square. He was a willing subject of the king. He probably believed, as we would have it in Romans 13, that God ordained and gave the king a divine right, but he was also about transformational grace and change. That's everywhere in his work, and also in the mind and work of his brother. Go out during one of our breaks to our courtyard here at Wesley Seminary and take a look at the cornerstone in our library, which is etched with Charles Wesley's advice to unite the pair so long disjoined, knowledge and vital piety. Our knowledge, our reason, our own experience will shape the way we respond to the primary teaching that we have, which is the gospel. That's the Wesley quadrilateral. And this offers for me the right framework to raise an issue on our minds here. What will we collectively do about the sorry state of our nation? Now, as a newcomer in the field of political th theology or public theology, I think we even don't even know precisely what we call this discipline. But I'm struck by the fact that much of the academic debate has been focused on whether the church indeed has a role to play in contemporary debates. Much of our literature in the field seems to be about justification for taking a stand and supporting or opposing those who do. Our debates sometimes reflect that same polarization that exists in the body politic. We have our fire-breathing liberal voices and equally strident conservative traditionalist orthodox proponents. Now those debates are healthy. They play out at places like the AAR and in various blogs that have sprung up now in social media where anyone can sort of self-publish and become an instant pundit. I don't demean these conversations because they are at the heart of how we interpret scripture, how we see ourselves as participants in the great unraveling of the mysteries of our faith. Yet I feel sometimes that the discussions are too inward focused. They are about who we are and what we believe rather than what we are doing to help guide the bewildered flock that we are supposed to shepherd. 
I think it's rare to walk into any mainstream church and hear a preacher confront the topics that the congregation has seen play out in the headlines or in the news. I suspect there's a natural instinct that many pastors have to avoid controversy, to divert from lines of argument that might further divide those who are in the pews. There are also many congregations that are of a single opinion, and the mindset of the pastor is simply to just express the unanimity of perspective that does not require any challenge to what might be pre-existing assumptions. Now we know from demographic data that Americans are increasingly locating themselves in neighborhoods where they believe they are surrounded by those who are generally of like mind. Those who study political reform say that the polarization in places like our U.S. Congress are, yes, partially the result of the way in which we draw political boundaries. The U.S. Supreme Court is examining the issue of gerrymandering even as we meet here today. But polarization also exists because we are less likely to seek out and engage others in our community who are different. We do not choose to move next to a household where the occupants are of a different color, faith, economic circumstance, or political view. We seek comfort zones where folks are just sort of like me. Now mind you, that's a general observation. It's not necessarily true for younger people who are now re-inhabiting the urban center, who are far more likely to live with and enjoy the diversity of their surroundings. But I'm speaking about the larger majorities in suburban, exurban, and rural communities. These are exactly the places where churches are struggling to maintain membership and relevance. Churches in these places hold on to members who have lived there a long time, but they're getting older and older now, but they're beginning to die and go on to the reward of everlasting life. Those churches are having a hard time recruiting new members, especially younger ones. I believe part of the dilemma is the failure of the church to connect the good news of the gospel to the very matters that the congregation see playing out in the controversies that swirl in the public square. The conversation in the sanctuary is not the one that the churchgoer will confront when he or she goes home after church and turns on CNN or Fox News. Now, I'm not suggesting that pastors in the pulpit need to take decidedly partisan positions. There are good reasons that our traditions and our IRS-enforced tax laws prohibit direct political involvement by churches, which have a nonprofit uh, charitable status, although the activities of some churches around direct political involvement is an interesting subject. Witness the recent debates over the so-called Johnson Amendment. But we do need to bring the burning topics of dialogue in the public square into the church. Our conversations about the hot topics of the day should not be confined to warmed over coffee during the social hour or heated conversations in the parking lot on the way home. The church needs to be at the center, at the center of dialogue. And yes, at the center where all voices are heard and listened to, where polarized people can begin to discover some common ground. Not every discussion can lead to compromise, or finding a happy medium or moderate middle, but we can be a place where genuine and authentic debate occurs and where people listen to and love those with whom they might profoundly disagree. Now to play that role, we need pastors skilled and adept at leading difficult conversations. That's not a talent easily acquired. It demands some changes in pedagogy, which is why we here at Wesley Seminary are considering adjustments in our own curriculum uh, to facilitate some new learning. How can we best turn out seminarians who will serve in a local church or other ministry settings and equip their congregations with the tools for genuine civil discourse? There are few places left in America where real dialogue can happen between those who have opposing views on the critical issues of the day. We hear often about the third place, beyond the home and workplace, where citizens might meet each other for real conversations. 
there's a limit to what the local pub can offer as a venue for that kind of dialogue. I'm suggesting that the church or the synagogue or the mosque or the place of worship needs to be at the center of that enterprise. But we also need leaders for those conversations, and I submit that's the primary challenge today for those of us in theological education. So to close with some advice from the patron of this conference, John Wesley, how can we foster the spirit of genuine civil discourse that our nation needs? In his sermon on a Catholic spirit, Wesley preached on 2 Kings 10, 15. Is your heart right as my heart is with your heart? Wesley said, if your heart is my heart, give me your hand. I think that's exactly what we need. May we be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion. Wesley asked then, but ask of all of us now, can we not start by building genuine relationships of love and trust so that we can share our opinions on the issues that divide us? To me, this is the beginning of a political theology that asks us to do all the good you can do. If those who are politically opposed but nonetheless share one heart, one vision for a better nation, I think we can find a way to do good. Being a do-gooder was sometimes an epithet back when I was growing up in the 1960s and 70s. I think it's now a label, a Wesleyan label, that we should all aspire to. My experience, my reason, my faith in our tradition, and my confidence in the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ tells me that the church must be at the center of a discussion about national renewal. We are a nation desperately divided, but we will find ways to make thine heart my heart and my heart thine. And if we do so, we will overcome the nastiness and the sulfur in our toxic political environment. We will be able to move on to the perfection that we are committed to as disciples of a God who earnestly wants us to love each other as we love ourselves. And that love is the formula to truly make America great again and to be the shining city on the hill that all of our recent politics has promised us. Thank you.